Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 732. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 18th, 2022. All right, you're watching another episode of Anglican Unscripted, 732. I hope you've watched them all because there's a lot of information there. Wow. Um, we're in Red Bay, Alabama, getting some work done and some upgrades installed on the RV. And so if you hear any hammering or sawing or knocking, anything short of an oops, uh-oh, I, I don't, we don't need to know about that. Oops and uh-ohs, I, I have to go check out. George, have you been you able been? to sleep for these past few days, Kevin? You look yeah, tired. I'm a little tired. Just I, it's a it's a long drive to get up here, George. It's from Florida to uh, the west side of uh, Alabama was uh, four three four hour days of driving, and then I had to stop, George, and I had to get diesel. And <laughs> I had to fill the tank oh, with diesel. My. That's four hundred dollars for half a tank of diesel. Now, people are asking in the comments on Facebook, what type of gas mileage do I get? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, I have a 150-gallon tank of gas, and I get nine miles to the gallon. So I can go a long, long, long way in one tank of gas, but uh, it's expensive. Thank you, Biden, for <laughs> this new expense in my life to, uh, to fill that tank up, George. Oh, my goodness. Well, you... Yeah. All, uh, Kevin, are you going to start uh, putting uh, appeals for uh, oh, donations? Yes. <laughs> Help uh, rescue Kevin. Get him out of uh, Alabama. He needs well, money to buy gas. The, 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 when the gas is high like this, we will just travel to one spot and stay there for a month or two. We're going to Wisconsin to visit mom and dad, and I'm going to stay there for two months. So I'm, not, I'm driving a lot less uh, this season because the gas is high. Like if we had the same amount of gas price the first season we drove, uh, that would have been an, an easy eight thousand dollar summer of, of just gas prices. So I'm not doing that. Mm -mm. So well, can't you put like uh, solar panels or a sail or something and uh, sail that I'll, boat of yours up? Call Elon Musk and Elon Musk and see what he can do for me. George, how you been doing? You new homeowner, you? Oh, great. Last night I installed two new toilets. Uh, lots of fun. Uh, I got the old man toilets that are about four or five inches taller than the regular toilets. It's because you're so tall. So poor Jill, if she visits us, her legs will swing. Uh, she uh, will be like a little child. I would but, too. But, you know, just, just, just all the little things that uh, we've, I've been wanting to do. And I'm starting small. I'm doing demolition and outside work and then important work. For me, it was toilets. For Susan, it's the kitchen. But uh, I won that one because toilets are cheaper than a kitchen. The, oh, yeah. Oh, geez. Doing any remodeling in this COVID, post-COVID times is very expensive. Uh, thankfully, uh, Joe Biden, uh, through inflation, making all this money, has made lumber expensive, uh, drywall, everything you'd want to do for a kitchen, cabinets. I have a friend looking at cabinets, and they were... Uh, uh, $7,800 to do new cabinets for her kitchen. And I'm like, no. I, I, I'll wait. I'll put up a little Ikea shelves. <laughs> There's no way. All right, let's move on to the news. We have a good news story to start off. Um, South Carolina, the Anglicans and the Episcopalians ha are in talks. And I'm going to use that in quotes. Here's my quote sign. They're in talks because I think Everybody is sick and tired of the, the legal fight. They both realized the uh, South Carolina Supreme Court was, was no help at all. They don't have an answer. It was, you know, a, another bad decision by the, the uh, Supreme Court. So now that they're, they're so desperate, they're talking. And we support that, George. Yes. Uh, previous episodes, we have encouraged the two to sit down and work out something that is charitable and mutually agreeable and builds the body of Christ in the kingdom rather than continue to slug it out and throw money into a pit with the lawyers fighting over it. Okay. Well, the reports were the Charleston Post Courier reported that after the Supreme Court decision, uh, Ruth Woodliffe Stanley, who is the Episcopal Bishop of South Carolina, who's only been in office a few months, 
uh, less than a year, and Chip Edgar, the Episcopal Bishop, Anglican Bishop of South Carolina, who's been in office of only a few months, less than a year also, they got together and met in Charleston, and they've been in talks. Uh, the Living Church Magazine published a story about this. Anglican Inc. published a story. The Living Church sort of had the Episcopal angle. We had the Anglican Church in North America angle. We had a uh, statement from Canon Lewis of the Acne Diocese. And both are basically saying, we can't tell you what we're talking about, but it's good that we're talking. And this does not affect the eight parishes that are asking for a rehearing from the South Carolina Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But what does this mean? Maybe they can work out. The Episcopal Diocese was awarded Camp Christopher at the summer camp. Maybe this means that they'll work out a way that the Acne Diocese can use that facility as well. Maybe there'll be some uh, lease agreements for the eight parishes that are uh, to be returned to the property of the Episcopal Diocese. Maybe their congregations can lease them and continue unmolested with a dollar a year or something like that. Whatever it is, we've moved out of the nasty lawyer phase into hopefully a charitable Christian phase of trying to find the best way forward for all. Now, the Diocese of Pittsburgh did this. Uh, the Episcopal and Anglican uh, came to an agreement where we're going to lease these churches for this amount of money over this amount of time. And, you know, that was a, a very wonderful way to come together in this um, and should set a standard for other dioceses who want to uh, come to an agreement. I do remember in Virginia a long, long time ago, Peter Lee tried to uh, come to an agreement with some churches. He set agreements, but he was stopped short by presiding Bishop Catherine Jefford Shorey. Yes, Falls Church and Truro, and I believe John Guernsey's church in Woodbury, Woodbury, Woodbury. Yeah. Uh, all uh, reached uh, settlements agreements with Peter Lee, the Bishop of Virginia. But then Catherine Jefford Shorey stepped in and scuttled everything, and that led to years of litigation going to the Virginia Supreme Court, hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on lawyers. Um, so there have been, in Central Florida, John Howe, the Bishop, allowed some churches to go completely unmolested. Jeffrey Steenson, who at that time was Bishop of the Rio Grande, he's now a Roman Catholic priest, uh, allowed the uh, Felix Orchis Church in El Paso, I think, to go uh, unmolested. So there is precedent for this, but we'll just see. Uh, the good news is that Catherine Jefferson Shorey is out of the picture, and her lawyer, David Booth Beers, recently died. So we've got new bishops in South Carolina. We have... Uh, hopefully a primate in the Episcopal Church who is not as micromanager as Jeffrey Shorey was. Yeah. And maybe God's will can be done for these churches and this diocese. I hope so. Uh, next story we have here. Our biggest uh, commented story on Anglican Inc. this week was uh, our story we did about communion without baptism. And when you first hear it, you say, well, of course not. You can't have communion without baptism. And then you got to think about it and think about it. And uh, I've thought about it. And we'll talk about that at the end of the story here. But there's always a backstory when this is going to be brought up at General Convention. So what's the backstory here, George? Well, this resolution is before the General Convention that meets this July. Um, it's had hearings at, at the Standing Committee on Liturgy and Church Music. And the Diocese of Northern California is asking to change the canons that require those coming to Holy Communion be baptized Christians. The rule of thumb in Episcopal churches, and I believe it's the same for Anglican and probably most other mainstream churches, is that if you are a baptized Christian, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water, you are welcome. And if you receive communion in your home church, you're welcome to receive here. That's basically the rule of thumb. That's what I practice. I don't check cards at the door. Well, the di this time around, the Diocese of Northern California, previous year was the Diocese of Eastern Oregon, have asked to remove that requirement of baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water. Now, you may ask, why so specific? Well, because 
The dioceses that have put this up in the past are in the Mormon territories, places where Mormons are a good chunk of the population. Mormon baptism is not recognized by the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church or most Christian churches as being a valid baptism because the words are different. The, the words may be similar, but the intention is different. The and it's not done, yeah. not done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with water. Now, let's say you're in Eastern Oregon or uh, Northern California where there are, you have Mormons looking at the Episcopal Church and they come to your services and they see a Methodist and they see Catholics going up to receive communion, you, they can't because they're not considered Christian. These dioceses were saying that this is really hindering their attempts at evangelism among Mormons. And in recent years, well, we have Buddhists and we have people who have no, no faith coming and we want to welcome them, fully include them in the life of the church. You know, we hear the inclusion buzzword. Hmm. Well, here's the man bites dog story, part of the story. The Episcopal Church's standing committee, the bishops on the committee were quite negative about this request, pointing out at one even, God help me, even cited the Articles of Religion oh. on this boy. I got chest pain, what? <laughs> and Articles of the, Religion? Uh, <laughs> and essentially saying this is theologically illiterate, theological ignorance. We value your intention, but this is not how you do it. This is not how you welcome people, no, right. So the the uh, issue will come before general convention. I expect it to be voted down. If it passes in the deputies because they, oh, peace, love, and happiness, we want to welcome everybody, the bishops will certainly kill it um, because part of their job is to uphold the doctrine and discipline. Yes, I know they haven't had a good, good show on that point. I know, I but this, <laughs> this might be a line that they're not going to cross. So I actually think this is going to die uh, and come back in three more years from from Idaho or someplace, you know, sure. some place where they have Mormons everywhere. Everywhere. Well, or Utah. Now, General Convention is being trimmed down. They're getting skinny. Uh, they're going to be in Baltimore, but they're not going to be a 10 day or a seven day. They're cutting down to four days this time. And I'm like, well, General Convention is a lot about the pop and the circumstance and the drama and the uh, just the, the Taj Mahal that is General Convention. I don't know how they can do that in four days if they're cutting it down, George. That going to be the same General Convention. Well, what's happened is that the Executive Council had an emergency session to discuss General Convention and COVID. It was postponed for from last year to the last summer to this summer. Well, the general convention leaders are still worried about COVID. And they asked the parliamentarians of the two houses of convention to come up with a plan to make it leaner and shorter. And so the parliamentarians have uh, said that we uh, recommend a four day convention and no visitors, no exhibit hall, no food services, uh, a vastly reduced pressed court, in fact, a press pool type operation. Retired bishops will be encouraged not to come and deputations will be limited to asking only their first alternates, not all four alternates to come. And just all of the, you know, events outside convention, public events, all be canceled. So, for instance, the Diocese of Maryland's already put, the convention's going to be in Baltimore this July. Uh, the Diocese have already put down money to uh, hold uh, catering facilities for the Maryland night. Uh, I'm sad they're not going to do the soft show crabs and hush puppies oh, and all that stuff. That would be I love so that fun. Stuff. That's canceled. Uh, some, no seminary dinners, no society, din historical society dinner, the the Neshota House dinner, all these things not going to happen this year for COVID concerns. Well, that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, so that means, and also if you want to come, I think you have to be double boosted or double vaccinated for your COVID. I'm not, I'm not and I'm not going <laughs> to <I'm not done. laughs> take my, get some more shots to please general convention. Mm -mm. 
Well, I think this is a good thing. And now I think they're responding a little hysterically to the whole COVID thing. I think that's passed, passed by its cell date. But I think they're going to realize they can save so much money in the future by not having into this extravaganza that you've talked about with elephants and uh, circus. Hoopla and circus. And, and, and it is, trying it to is get tens of thousands yeah. of people to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they just focus on the actual business of the church and not have all these extraneous resolutions, you know, and the embargo on Cuba, free Mumia Abu Jamal, all this. Shame on Israel, there. yes. Yeah. yeah, all this stuff that is of no consequence to anybody, both in the convention hall, except for the movers of the mm-hmm. resolutions, and in the world at large. Because, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I can remember last, uh, convention before last, I reported on a debate in the House of Bishops, do dogs go to heaven? And that took like a half hour. And the bishops were enjoying themselves because it was a fun little debate. They all got to make puns like dogs, yes, cats, no, things like that. (laughs) But really, is that the business of the church with limited resources and limited time? And so that sort of stuff will sort of pass to the wayside. And uh, the focus of the church will be on more important issues, budgets and programs and things of that nature. Well, I have one dog who's definitely going to be in heaven. I have two others that there's no way they're making the cut. All right. They're just dumb dogs. But, yeah, I see what you're saying. Now, if you follow the leadership in the Episcopal Church closely with their press statements and stuff, every time there's a tragedy or a shooting or something, you, you discover that there's no more black crime. And I thought we could talk about Michael Curry because uh, throughout the, the season, there's... Uh, white on white crime there's black on black crime there's white on black crime and there's black on white crime he only seems to respond when there is white on black crime and i thought we could talk about that george yeah the presiding bishop released a statement following the shooting by a uh, uh, white supremacist uh, mm-hmm. teenage kid uh, evil fellow who went who drove from Broome County, New York, about three hours north to Buffalo and deliberately shot up a uh, supermarket in a black part of town to kill black people. Uh, Presiding Bishop issued a statement and, you know, it's a good statement on its own, but in isolation, here's the problem. We didn't get similar statements when that black nationalist, black supremacist shot up the subway car or when that fellow up in in New York City. Yep. And when that fellow, it... You, you pronounce that word, Kevin, I can't. Waukesha, Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this winter, was it last fall or this winter? Last fall. A fellow, a felon, you know, I think he was out on bail for something already, drove through a parade killing six white people and injuring 60 other white people in a very white town of Waukesha, Wisconsin. Yeah. And it's an evil act. All three acts are evil. And... The initial response from the left in the church is silence on the two black initiated crimes and over the top on the white one. Now, this this white this kid issued a manifesto, which people reference, but nobody's actually seems to have read on MSNBC. The well, guy's says, not a says, right. He, no, he, he he says he's not a Christian. He describes himself as antifa. He's you know he's a fascist to to the boot. You know. The guy is an eco-socialist anarchist who supports the hard left. So this is not some Republican gun nut kid from the woods. This is not Jethro with his shotgun. This is some kid who has been radicalized over the internet by Antifa and Black Lives Matter, except this time his racism and his anger is being taken out of black people, which I don't think there are any in Broome County where he lives. So. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I, mean, I want to separate the incident itself, which is abhorrent, mm-hmm. and I hope the guy gets the chair. I don't know if they do that in New York anymore. Yeah. I hope he gets the electric chair at Sing Sing. Uh, if not, well, he'll never see the light of day outside of Attica prison. But how the church responds is uneven, where certain lives are valuable and other lives aren't. 
those who were killed in the subway shooting, those who were killed in the parade in Waukesha, don't merit the same level of sympathy and empathy as the uh, shoppers who deserve sympathy and empathy in Buffalo. I'm not saying one group doesn't deserve it, but I think everybody who is a victim of this race-based crime, the victim should be treated equally. Absolutely. And the perpetrator should be condemned equally. And we shouldn't make the mistake of treating perpetrators by their race because we're just perpetuating the evils that they're uh, trying to uh, push on society. In this nation, justice is supposed to be blind. Okay, we're supposed to, to treat everyone equally uh, according to the law. And I see people like uh, Presiding Bishop Michael Curry, President Joe Biden. Biden. All, yeah, uh, the, his press secretaries, all that, only attack the white people. Because white on black crime is somehow worse than black on white crime. And you no, know, crime is crime. Hate crime is hate crime. And you can't make one worse than the other. Uh, to do so divide society, which I think that's the desire of the, the Biden administration is to divide this country, but um, we need to say something sometime. Yeah, yeah but, but, but for, our, for, the, for the two critics, my mother-in-law and Kevin's <laughs> wife on the, we're not, downplaying the evil that occurred yeah. we're saying that there should be equality across the board in responding to these issues absolutely and not make our responses based on race no not at all all right more good news we have uh, three bishops were elected in florida this last week and i thought we could go through the names uh from the act aside uh alex farmer was elected uh someone you know and i think you know the other two bishops as well let's go through the list well, Alex Farmer was elected Bishop of the Gulf Atlantic Diocese of the ACNA on Saturday uh, at a convention in Tallahassee. Uh, my, Al, my children attended uh, uh, a church camp where Alex was the priest uh, counselor advisor. Mm -hmm. So I've known him, I guess, maybe 10, 15 years. He was a rector in Gainesville under the Episcopal Church and then moved over to the ACNA. Excellent choice. Excellent choice. The ACNA is getting a superior person mm. to lead their diocese at this time. Same day, in Jacksonville, Charlie Holt was elected the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Florida. Hold, hold, hold on. He's conservative, George. Charlie, uh, I've known for 20 years. Yeah. He was rector of uh, St. Uh, he was rector of, in this diocese for 16 years. Uh, then he's been in Houston for four years at that massive church as head of Christian education or something, and uh, forget his exact title, but he was the only one not from the Diocese of Florida, and he was the most conservative person on the ticket. And Charlie's theology uh, on the ethical moral issues is indistinguishable from Alex Farmer's. Mm -hmm. um, if Charlie had been Bishop uh, instead of Sam Howard, we would never have had this. We would, Florida would have been like Central Florida, some people leaving, but not the massive problem that they suffered. Yeah. Um, but Charlie is a great hope for the future of the Episcopal Church. Um, he's articulate, he's energetic, he's, he's, he's a very winning fellow. Now, the third person elected was Douglas Scharf, who I do not know as I know the other two, I know of him. He was a rector down in Southeast Florida and was elected Bishop uh, last month in April, end of April, I believe it was, for Southwest Florida, replacing Dabney Smith. Um, Dabney I knew because he was a rector of a church next to mine 20 odd years ago. And Dabney is a conservative, but he dances along the line. He, you know, he'll go along to get along, but his heart is in the right place. Uh, but Douglas Scharf is also a good pastor he has a sound theological mind and so what's happening and central florida will be electing a bishop new bishop in january hmm. uh nominations opened uh, may may 1st they closed may 30th central florida requires that the persons be nominated by a priest active priest in the diocese and a active lay person in the diocese so that sort of shuts out 
a lot of people from out of. I out can't of call it and say I know this rector. Can you? I, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm, I get it. I get it. All right. And so we're going to have a really good crop of candidates. Um, I've been nominated, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we'll just see how that goes. But I think the bigger picture is that Florida remains a prime. It's been good times for the state of Florida compared to the rest of the country, economically, politically. We have a stable, effective government. We've got a good tax environment. Uh, no hurricanes so far this year. <laughs> Still and got a lot of swampland, but yeah. <laughs> the Anglican and Episcopal churches, I think, can really... See, one of our problems is that we have so many people move here. There's a little statistic that uh, I believe it was 60% of the Democrats registered to vote in Florida moved to Florida. So they basically bring their politics from New York and California with them. Um, but then they gradually sort of see the light, Hopefully. if you will, politically speaking. Same with the Episcopal Diocese. Everybody's from somewhere else. And they bring with them the issues that are active and alive and vital up north or out west or in the Midwest, wherever they are. But the diocese in Florida, except for Southeast Florida, which is a liberal diocese, the diocese in Florida have been able to maintain the focus on Jesus Christ, both Anglican and Episcopal. And I think we're in a good place right now, besides being in a great place, Florida. <laughs> the Sunshine State. All right, let's uh, finish well, up. And, and I yeah. really also want to ask our viewers to pray for my discernment. Yeah. Some of you know I've been nominated in the past. Um, I actually entered the process in Springfield, but withdrew early because I didn't feel called. And I was asked to run in a number of other places. And I told Kevin about each time, and he looks at me, and I can tell him, and 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 it's not for you. <laughs> uh, but I really do need to have prayer for discernment. Is this God's call in my life? I mean, everybody, every all priests are uh, want to be a bishop. It's natural progression but it's not a job it's a call from god right and is this a call on my life so yeah. ask the holy spirit to speak clearly to me should i come in, go in into the process or pull out from the process good point all right last story um australian synod this is a long story if you have not watched the video i did with uh david old a, a week ago uh, watch that because that was talking about you know going into the synod and the expectations and a lot happened in the the days of the synod and what was surprising most of us was how unorthodox on classic on traditional the bishops were and I thought we could talk a little bit about this George because it's not like the Episcopal Church where all the houses are, are screwed up here it's just the house of bishops the i see the australian general synod results as a victory for the orthodox conservatives it was not a complete victory no. but it certainly stopped the liberal juggernaut in its tracks now the australian general synod the anglican church in australia is organized differently than the church of england or the episcopal church or the ACNA for that matter. Most people will know the how the American churches are organized. In the Episcopal Church, any bishop can go to general convention and has a vote. Dioceses have the same number of deputies for clergy for lay. So the Diocese of Northern Michigan with 400 active members, uh, they basically have one vote per 50 people where the Diocese of uh, Texas or the Diocese of Virginia or Massachusetts with 100,000 members, um, you know, it, there's not an equality of voting. Australia, the clergy vote, uh, you, I think you get one deputy for one delegate for every 20 active clergy in your diocese. And I think there's a similar form for lay people and only one bishop. So if you've got three assistants and three retirees, they don't get to vote. So the general synod is representative 
of the actual population of the Anglican world in Australia. And at this recent synod, the lay people and the clergy supported the definition of marriage, one man, one woman, pushing back against the liberal agenda very, very clearly. But it failed in the House of Bishops because two bishops abstained and two bishops who were expected to go one way because of their public statements in the past went the other way. That so, never happens. That never happens. That never happens. Well, then in the next day, a resolution condemning the bishops for their failure to speak the orthodox creedal faith was endorsed. So I see that as a victory because it's quite clearly put the bishops who are going against the theological mind on notice that, hey, they can't go this way. Now, see, if the Episcopal Church back, my first general convention as a reporter was in 1997. At that time, the Episcopal Church nationally was more conservative than liberal. But the way it's organized with diocese voting and whatnot, the liberals controlled the general conventions and just ran through their agenda. And when they did this, more and more conservatives dropped out until finally you're in the same we're in the position we are now. But recent, but you know, surveys conducted by the uh, who is it uh, Q. Is it? No, not Pew. Uh, Gallup. The Gallup poll showed that people in the pews in the Episcopal Church still, at this time, are evenly divided between conservatives and liberals. Now, if you look at the House of Bishops, what, is it 90-10? Mm -hmm. The deputies, 90-10, favoring the liberals? But the actual people who show up in church on Sunday and put dollars into the plate, from all intents and purposes, are the same people who were there 30 years ago. So political games have put the Episcopal Church into this position. But the Australians seem to have worked out a way so that um, they're not going to go down the road we've taken. Let's hope so. And yeah, I too agree that, you know, whereas they did vote to condemn the bishops, right? Yes, they did. Yeah, and yes, so they did. that's good enough for me. You know. Now, I encourage you all to look on Anglican Inc., uh, where we've reprinted all of David Old's uh, reporting, as well as review the film uh, Kevin did with David Old, mm -hmm. and that gives you a detailed sense of where things are. Um, but uh, David was a deputy or a delegate yeah. and from the Diocese of Sydney, and uh, you know God is just doing great things there uh, with a great archbishop, great clergy leaders, great lay leaders. A lot of potential down there. We don't have that potential quite yet here. But, but, but see, yeah. the, like the Church of England, like the Episcopal Church, has a disconnect between its bishops yeah. and the people in the pews. It does. Now, in Australia, you see this very clearly because the bishops went one way, everybody else went the other. But in the Church of England, for instance, when we had all the controversies over Brexit, there was only one bishop in the Church of England who supported leaving uh, the Brexit. Uh, Exit, exiting the European Union yeah. and every other bishop was vociferous in pushing the remain in Bre remain vote well when that that bishop eventually decided to leave the house of bishops and go back to parish ministry I think he was so isolated and basically felt so useless because he was the one odd man out so but the majority polls consistently show the majority of Anglican Church of England worshippers were pro-Brexit, completely divorced. Uh, it's just like the, the polls show that the majority of clergy are pro-labor, whereas the majority of the people in the pews are pro-Tory. Um, <clears throat> but the way the system is set up, it's the elites and the establishment that run the show. No, agreed. All right, well, that's that was a good show, George. Uh, we we put it together a day late because they're doing stuff on the RV, and it's not like I have a, uh, another place I can go and record if there, there's a lot of noise going on here. So um, we got to work that as as we travel. We're headed from here slowly up to Wisconsin. Uh, we'll 
keep watching on Facebook. You want to see the trip and pictures. George, we'll catch you uh, Friday. Wonderful. I'm, I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 732. Did yeah, I get we'll that right? That. Yeah, you got it right. 732 of Anglican Unscripted.